Thank you, John, you know, and the kind introduction but for your friendship and for the example of excellence you have set for the profession. Thank you very much. Uh, Merrill, um, congratulations to you. Um, not so great for you to go back to follow. <laughs> but, but that's okay. Uh, you earned it. Thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you all, especially for, um, on my behalf, TiVo in the last episode of Breaking Bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, tremendous. Uh, listen, uh, thank you. There's so many people to thank. Um, uh, Bill Nielsen, a uh, friend and mentor, really, over 20 years, you know, stop and think about it. It's pretty remarkable. Um, Roger, John, again, uh, Page Honors Committee, uh, fellow trustees, and um, our the Page Society members, and I treasure our fellowship. Uh, the Page Society has supported my career and enriched my life, uh, really, um, in so many ways. I want to especially acknowledge uh, all the previous Hall of Fame inductees. I mean, just to be in your company is just a singular honor for me. And uh, how happy I am to recognize Marjorie Krause. Um, last year's inductees allowed me to join the Apco family. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be joining the team, Marjorie. Another hard part, I have to say something meaningful or at least not irrelevant. Uh, it's a challenge because uh, today you can get profound observations any time in any political flavor, from Bill O'Reilly to Rachel Maddow or any other uh, oracle. So I thought I'd simply convey uh, some of the lessons that have attached to me as, as I pack my way through the brambles of a corporate communications career. Uh, after all, some of it has been pretty interesting, although I think it would have been a lot more interesting if it had happened to somebody else. <laughs> When, uh, when Bill told me I was to be inducted into the uh, Hall of Fame, um, I gasped and I told him I better re-examine my life. Uh, it seems like I was just sitting in the introduction to public relations uh, class at Marquette University. I was listening to a guest lecture by the head of communications for Wisconsin Bell. And um, uh, I chose to study journalism first with the atten uh, intention of being a sports writer. Uh, then Watergate happened and I decided I wanted become the next Woodward and Bernstein, along with just about every other aspiring journalist. But here was this confident, authoritative representative of the phone company talking about their millions upon millions of connections and how telecommunications impacted every facet of every life, every day. Uh, perhaps it was prophetic that a guest lecture by an executive from Arthur Page's very company set me on a path to this honor. Uh, well, fast forward to Bill's phone call, and, and suddenly I'm pondering metaphysical questions about my life and our profession. Uh, do I matter? Uh, have I added value? Um, do uh, we do something important? Uh, actually, I actually have been asking myself many of these questions uh, since the first day of my first job as a communications jack of all trades for a small hospital not far from here. Uh, those were good old pre-digital days when producing the hospital newsletter meant manually typing the text. Uh, taking the photos, developing the film, you remember that? Uh, printing the photos, laying it all out by hand, driving it to the printer. Driving it to the printer. <laughs> did, it, <laughs> did it matter? Um, I decided that yes, it mattered that employees had a better understanding of their workplace, that they were excited to read about uh, themselves and their coworkers, and uh, it mattered that the community had a better understanding of the resources that we offered. So I decided to stay in this line of work and said goodbye to a journalism career. This will pay a little better. In 37 years of corporate communications experience since then, I've had a lot of fun, made a lot of mistakes, and learned a lot of lessons. At Public Service of New Hampshire, the principal electric utility in my home state, I learned that it is a lot more satisfying, though a lot riskier, to ride to the sound of the guns. I started my career like that feather in Forrest Gump, uh, floating on a breeze, hoping to land in a hospitable place. But at PSNH, uh, as, it, as it encountered more and more controversy as the lead owner of a uh, massive nuclear power construction project, I found challenge and opportunity and relevance and saw a clear connection between the positions I advocated and the outcomes that resulted. During World War II, Winston Churchill remarked that there is nothing quite as exhilarating as being shot at without result. Well, that's how I felt at PSNH. Uh, we were forever on the edge of success and calamity. There were 12 years of media battles, protests, legislative attacks, financial daring do, bankruptcy and takeover. Seabrook became the focus of the national anti-nuclear movement, 
and an important theme of Mike Dukakis' presidential campaign, though apparently not important enough. When the, when the fog of battle lifted, there was an 1150 megawatt nuclear plant sitting in Seabrook, New Hampshire. PSNH was bankrupt and acquired, and I was out of a job. While there was no fun to be out of work with three little kids and one big mortgage, I quickly found comfort in two revelations. And, and I wrote this, I swear, before hearing Doug today. Uh, but first, I learned that the way I conducted myself was as important as the product of my actions. Now, this came home to me when the first call of support I received after being released by our new owners came from the lead attorney or Seabrook's principal opponent. We had clashed mightily over the years, but it was never personal. It was business. <laughs> I know that at times, I know that at times, I was a bit too strident in advocating my positions, but overall I really did try to remain calm, patient, and good humored, and it really made a difference. The other lesson I learned during my PSNH years was that rather than run my career, the Sheba controversy, and even PSNH's bankruptcy, provided experience that allowed me to go to the next level. There I was, just out of college, coming from my vacationing boss in my first summer at PSNH, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission had just pulled Seabrook's construction permit, and I was on the phone with Time Magazine and NBC, uh, the New York Times on hold. And that's when those media outlets meant something. Um, but it was a thrilling, frightening rush. It pushed me to the limits of my abilities, and I soon found that prospective employers considered my PSNH experience to be a badge of honor rather than a scarlet letter. Later on at the uh, Niagara Mohawk Power Corp in Syracuse, we faced an existential crisis due to onerous uh, government-mandated contracts. These were power purchase agreements that uh, grew out of the post embargo years. If we didn't restructure those contracts, it was only a matter of time until our customers revolted or the company failed or both. But we had no leverage. The contracts, though onerous, were legal and binding, so we created our own leverage through a broad and intense communications campaign that shined a brilliant beam of light on the issue. That light also generated heat, which in turn generated government-sponsored negotiations and ultimately a restructuring uh, of the contracts that preserved value for Niagara Mohawk shareholders, treated the contract holders fairly, and allowed Niagara Mohawk to survive. The plan worked because our arguments were sound and we delivered them with conviction and persistence, or said another way. We told the truth and we proved it with action. And we executed our communications program as though the whole company depended on it, and it did. By the time I got to AIG, on the eve of the great financial crisis, I thought I was pretty smart. Uh, but then I had uh, headed communications for three Fortune 500 companies and experienced challenges that many people don't see in a career. In addition to PSNH and Niagara Mohawk, I had what I call a near death experience in the entertainment business. It was a brief, tumultuous stint as head of, uh, as head of uh, communications for uh, Paramount uh, before it was acquired by Viacom. And there are many valuable lessons there from navigating an uber-competitive corporate culture and exposure to M&A and other financial issues. And that's not to mention the leathery maturity you gain from supremely dissonant experiences such as the, the ecstasy of having uh, access to the owner's suite in the Madison Square Garden and the agony of getting reamed out over what member of the media you invited or didn't invite, or what you might have selected for the menu that night. And there was also American Electric Power, which did such a good job of diversifying from a state Midwest utility into a dynamic energy marketer and trader that it became the largest trading partner of a now defunct company known as Enron. Uh, I could feel the wisdom accumulating in my bones when Enron imploded, and we lost a billion dollars uh, in market cap in the blink of an eye, and this is when a billion dollars really mattered. <laughs> so as I said, I'd seen a lot by the time I got to AIG, uh, but when the crisis hit, I thought I still had plenty to learn. Looking back, I should have responded faster, should have gotten outside help sooner. Whether it was human nature or just my nature, I continue to believe things couldn't possibly get worse, and they would soon start to get better. They didn't. <laughs> they indeed got worse and until, uh, until a great company with outstanding people became the focus of popular anger and anxiety as the financial crisis deepened. There are many hard-earned lessons there. In addition to learning that you can always prepare better and act faster, I learned that in a crisis, sometimes the biggest challenges are internal. The crisis often introduces new players, such as bankers, lawyers, consultants. 
not to mention government and regulatory representatives. They all have different perspectives, needs, and expectations. In many cases, they have preconceptions that may or may not be correct, and that's when you'll find out if you really are accommodation and good humor. And you'll also find out that you've done a good job building strong relationships with your corporate peers, the people you need to help you get through the crisis. But there are many positive lessons as well. One is that no matter how bad your situation seems to be, you have supporters, and they're looking to you for the reasons and the tools to support you. Of course, chief among those supporters are your employees, and I must say that at AIG we were indeed mindful that the character of the enterprise was expressed and maintained by uh, our employees through the most difficult circumstances one can imagine. I'm guessing that not many of the organizations you represent have had to deal with organized bus tours to harass your employees and their families at their homes, or had employees jeered and spat upon, even attacked, solely because of who they work for. But no matter what happened, we did our best to keep our employees around the world up to date uh, on developments while encouraging them to persevere. Through the tumult of the crisis, uh, we had four CEOs in 14 months. A half serious line heard around the office was if my boss calls, get his name. <laughs> it's not a joke. Happily, none of those four CEOs needed convincing. The first order of business was the well being of our people. It was their first priority, and more than anything else, it was the character of AIG's people that helped them endure and recover, clearly corroborating Arthur Page's wisdom. A related AIG learning was no matter how hopeless you think the situation is, it isn't. There are positive things you can do to turn around the most dismal situation, and believe me, the situation got pretty dismal. The lowest point for me, that to hell with the moment, came at the height of the media frenzy while I was on the phone with Carol Loomis, one of the best business journalists of our time. Carol was informing me that what looked like a positive story she had been working on about turning AIG around was taking a negative turn. She had obtained a harsh email written to our outgoing CEO, who's the CEO number two, uh, by a fatigued, despairing senior executive on the night the government took over AIG. And as I tried to process how this could have happened, I saw another note on my desk that Bloomberg was calling again about yet another compensation controversy. And just then, my assistant put another note in front of me that said, call 60 minutes. I really wanted to just put down the phone and back away slowly. Uh, but with, with uh, the help of some smart people uh, on my staff and help from Harold Burson and some smart people at Burson Marsteller, we focused on several journalists who had been covering us fairly and dispassionately and earned some insightful uh, stories that really helped calm the waters. And by the way, the 60 Minutes piece was chief among them. The AIG experience taught me how difficult and how important it is to maintain a strategic posture in a crisis. You can't allow yourself to get caught up in the skirmishes. You have to refine and simplify your story, tell it consistently and in a coordinated manner, and never stop driving your message. AIG is meeting its customers' needs and is working to repay the government. That message, or some variant of it, was carried through AIG's communications starting at the outset of the crisis. And look what they've achieved. AIG has indeed met its obligations to customers and repaid the government. So you keep making your case. The other noise will eventually but surely fade away, but your message will resonate. 